you would take your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. I appreciate the work that the Bible class teachers are doing here. What you're doing is so important. And I'm constantly praying as I talk to God in prayer for the fruit of your labors. And I know some of you have been teaching Bible classes here for a long, long time. And maybe at times you think, am am I making a difference? I tell you what, I can tell you as Paul told the Corinthians that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I appreciate the work that you're doing and may God bless you to continue that. I think about when I was growing up in Bible class and I love the story of Naaman. To me, it was right up there with David and Goliath, with uh, Daniel in the lion's den, and Ehud uh, sticking a knife in the big king's belly. And I love that one. But I want you to look at 2 Kings chapter 5. I want you to look particularly at verse 1, what we read about Naaman. It's interesting. Think about this with me. In the first verse, Of 2 Kings chapter 5, we read, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. Naaman, we see, was a commander of the army of the king of Syria. Great and mighty. He was a man among men. Someone that was looked up to. He was a national hero in Syria because of his victories. Syria was Israel's enemy. So whom had the Lord given Syria victory over? Israel. And you say, why would the Lord give him victory over his own people? But God had to punish Israel. Because if you remember, they were sinning and living wickedly and practicing idolatry. And eventually they would be driven out of the land because of that into captivity. But Naaman was a mighty man of valor. He was an up-and-coming hero star in the nation of Israel. A mighty man. It seemed like he was on top of the world. He's someone that Well, pride could have gone to his head, but people would have had to be careful not to envy to be in a position like that. The king's right-hand man, his his master found uh, him as an honorable and great man. And that says a whole lot about him. But I want you to notice at the end of verse 1, three words. Three words that say so much, that speaks volumes, but a leper. You know, everything up to that point, so positive. So positive about Naaman. But but you see what? He had a problem, and it's a game changer. It's a huge problem. Leprosy was probably one of the most feared diseases in the world at this time. You know, and I remember studying this story as a very young boy. And I knew the story, but I didn't really know what God wanted me to get out of this story. And as I started moving up uh, through the classes, you know, we start the kids out here in the bucket class and they move up. And as I started moving up in the classes when I was growing up, you know, teachers were talking about these stories and I knew the story, but they were teaching me why that story was there and what God wants us to know from that story. And there's so many ways that we can approach 2 Kings chapter 5, so many comparisons that we can make about salvation, but I want us to think about this disease that Naaman had and how it compares to sin. Sin is a disease. It is like a spiritual leprosy that affects the soul. So let's make some comparisons between sin and leprosy this evening. Leprosy begins small. It seems like no big deal. From what I've been able to find out about leprosy and read about this, 
it starts very small like a white spot or a powdery patch of skin, almost like a rash. You probably wouldn't think much about it. It doesn't seem like a big deal. It's not something to be so concerned about. Some had written about it that it was like a scab that appeared uh, lower than the surface of the skin. Didn't seem to be any big deal. But then, then it grows. It progresses. And it would eventually cover the whole body. And it would spread and the nerve endings in the skin and the affected areas, those nerve endings would die. And boils would break out over the body leaving gaping wounds of raw flesh. And eventually, parts of the body would fall off. Their facial features would lose its shape, and they became grotesque to look at. It was a very serious thing. But it started out small, and I think sin is like that. And maybe, and it's a dangerous thing when we start categorizing sins as small and think it's not any big deal. And I think the world does that about lying. And they call it white lies. And, it's, and sometimes you're, you're really doing that to, to make someone feel better and not to hurt their feelings. But God takes lying serious, and we need to be careful. And, and it grows and grows, and, and pretty soon you can be caught in a web of lies. I remember somebody one time, and it was a joke really, but they had a, a board out, a white board, and they had all these people, that they, they knew their names on it and the lies that they told them and, and, because they didn't want to be caught in a lie. So they had to try to remember the lies that they told someone. And it got to be monumental. But sin, we might look at it and say, well, that's just no big deal. It's innocent enough. What doesn't appear to be all that wrong can escalate to something that really takes control of our life, our thinking, our behavior. What doesn't appear to be all that wrong, it can invade our spiritual life. In James chapter 1, a very practical book in the New Testament, James, the half-brother of Jesus, talks about sin beginning as really a simple thought. And that's usually where sin starts, is in the mind, in our thought process. So he says sin begins as a simple thought. Then that thought turns into an evil desire or lust. And when it is conceived thought on, rehearsed, incubated, it brings forth sin. And sin results in death. That's James 1 verses 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You see, leprosy, it would progress to the point that people no longer felt pain in the affected parts of the body. The nervous system had become so compromised that that area had no feeling. Does that remind you of some passages in Scripture? I think of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 what Paul said to his son of the faith, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it speaks of a conscience that is seared with a hot iron. Sin, like leprosy, I believe, is progressive. Sin, we should abhor that. We should horror at the thought of committing sin. And I've heard people say that I will never, and we need to be careful saying never, I will never do that. I could never do that. But then they began to rationalize and they began to justify. And I suppose it's not too bad. One time, what will that hurt? 
After all, the Bible says, moderation in all things. Or perhaps I know a lot of people who do worse than that. How many alcoholics would there be if no one ever took the first drink? How many drug addicts would there be if someone never took an illegal drug? But then you move from that to participation. Well, I did it. Nothing seemed to change. You know, I told a lie and lightning didn't strike me. Or I committed adultery and the world didn't come to an end. My wife and my children still love me. You start thinking that sin is no big deal. And then you get into the phase of resignation and acceptance. And your conscience is seared. You commit sin without guilt. You, you quit putting up a fight against temptation. There's no godly sorrow for your sin. We commit a particular sin in our conscience. Our heart is no longer touched by that. It is a hideous progression. The nature of sin, just like leprosy. And you know you can get to that point of no return. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, it talks about someone who was once saved and they lose that salvation. And it's impossible for them to return. And it's not because of God, it's because of that person. Their heart is so hard, their neck is so stiff, their ears are so dull, there's nothing you can say, there's nothing you can do. Their heart cannot be pricked anymore. And that's a dangerous place to be. So see the danger of sin up front and where it can lead. Because it can get a grip on you. Don't start sinning. Don't go down that road. Don't start thinking that it's no big deal. If it's no big deal, why did Jesus have to be crucified to the cross of Calvary? Sin is a horrible thing. And we need to see the seriousness of it. You know, people think about leprosy in that day. And can you imagine all those good things, impressive things about Naaman? But a leper, oh, what a shame. Oh, that's horrible. What a waste. Sin. We need to see the seriousness of it. You know, if I told you I had cancer, how would you react? What if I told you I'm lost in sin? What would that do to you? That's worse. Being lost in sin is worse, and we need to see the seriousness of sin. Romans chapter 1, when I think about the progression of sin, I think about what Paul writes in the latter part of Romans chapter 1. The first part, you know, he's talked about uh, Jesus Christ declaring himself to be the Son of God by the resurrection. Talks about how he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You get into the latter part of Romans chapter 1 and he talks about the progression of sin and how it starts out with just people being unthankful to God. Not as grateful as they should be. But where does it lead? Paul says they become senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They become gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil and are disobedient to parents. Sin may start out small, but it grows like a cancer, and it spreads. And we need to realize the seriousness of, of it up front. Second comparison I want to make about sin and leprosy is that they separate. 
Now you think about leprosy and you know they, when you were found to have leprosy, the moment they realized that you had it, that was discovered, you were immediately banished from society. And this is what you could expect. For the next 10 to 20 years, you would be in isolation. That's quarantine. And we, we've all learned a little bit more about quarantine in our lives lately, haven't we? I feel like I went into quarantine last year and came out a senior citizen. But you could expect to live in isolation for about 10 or 20 years. And then you would die. It was a terminal disease. Can you imagine how this mighty warrior, this military general felt when he realized that spot on his skin was leprosy and what his fate was? Spots of death is what those were. So you read about in the Old Testament, you read about how they were to be separated from society. They had their own colonies. And if ever they had to come in somewhat near people, it was law that they had to yell out, unclean, unclean, unclean. People would run when they heard that. Why? Because it's so contagious they had to separate themselves from these people. And you think about sin and how it separates. I've seen sin in my lifetime. I've seen it uh, divide families, break up marriages. I've seen it divide churches. But sin always separates us from God. It puts up a division between us and God. It affects our relationship with God. In Isaiah chapter 59, the first two verses we read, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Yes, I think in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was distressed, greatly distressed, thinking about the separation that he would have with his Father because of our sins. Sin separates us from God. It affects our relationship with him. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and I think that's talking about being able to be in the presence of God. Sin separates us from God. Thus we would need reconciliation by the blood of Jesus Christ. But sin separates. Sin is highly contagious. And the people had to separate themselves from it. We need to separate ourselves from sin. We need to be as careful about separating ourselves from sin as people in the these times separated themselves from lepers. Avoid sin at all costs because sin is unclean, unclean, unclean. Next time you're tempted to sin, see it that way. It's deceitful. It lies to you. Oh, if I could just have that. Oh, I'd love to just see this on the internet. That would be a thrill. I tell you what, friends, we have to be so careful about sin. And in talking about repentance and having that godly sorrow for sin, to the alcoholic that repents, why would they keep a bottle of alcohol just in case they want to go back? They should steer clear of that. Why would someone that has a problem with pornography, why would they uh, allow themselves to go into a room when nobody's home and look at those things. We need to separate ourselves from sin. We need to avoid it. We don't need to give Satan a foothold. He already has enough advantages. We don't need to give him any more. Don't put yourself out there. Realize the ugliness of sin. Separate yourself from it. Avoid it at all costs. It's unclean. 
And it will separate us from our God eternally if we're not careful. And that leads us to the last point in this lesson. Leprosy led to death. When somebody was told they had leprosy, it was like a death sentence. It's like they were on death row, just waiting their turn to die from it. From what I understand, and the death rate for leprosy was 100%. 100%. No known cure. But I tell you what, friends, God has a cure. And he had a cure for Naaman. And you know the rest of the story of Naaman. How he got to Israel and how he went to Elisha's house and how Elisha sent the servant out to tell him from God what he needed to do to be cleansed of his leprosy. Naaman came to see Elisha. And Elisha didn't even bother to come down to meet him, this great Syrian general. He sends the messenger and gives him instruction. The message was to go dip seven times in the Jordan River to be cleansed. Naaman was upset. He was upset that Elisha would not come out to see him and pray over him. He wanted all these theatrics. But Elisha, we see, did not give him those big dramatic things he was looking for in his healing. So Naaman was upset. He was frustrated. He had traveled all this way. And he said, he's probably saying to himself, what a waste of time. But thankfully, his servants had a right mind and were thinking correctly and were able to influence Naaman to do it because Naaman was just ready to storm off. Do this simple thing, Naaman. This is all you have to do. You know, what if he asked you to do something great? All you have to do is go over to that Jordan and dip in it seven times. And he did. And we see that he was cleansed of this leprosy. How thankful was he? He was thankful. He wanted to give the prophet a gift. Unfortunately, we see that the sin of the prophet of God's servant in the New Testament, Jesus himself cleansed ten lepers. Cleansed them while they were on their way to the priest. How many of those ten came back to thank Jesus? Saving them from death. Cleansing them of leprosy. One. One out of ten. That's a sad commentary, isn't it? Let me ask you, if you've been cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ from your sins, how thankful are you to the Lord? Don't take that for granted because sin is a death sentence. And if we don't go to the great physician, we're going to be lost eternally in hell. I don't want to see that happen to anybody. I don't want to see that happen to you. To be separated with God, from God, for all eternity in a place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's where sin will lead you. Do you remember James 1, 14 and 15? Sin leads to death. I'm not talking about losing your life. And it could lead to that because there's consequences of sin. But I'm talking about something much worse. I'm talking about losing your soul. I'm talking about being without God forever. It's a serious thing. It's a serious matter. We need to realize where sin leads. Just like leprosy, it, it, it led to, to death. In Ezekiel 18 and verse 4 and also verse 20 of Ezekiel 18, the Bible says, The soul that sinneth, it will surely what? die. That says the soul, not the person. It says the soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. 
die. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 tells us plainly that the wages of sin is what? Death. We should all know that if we've been saved from our sins, that we owe God a debt that we can never repay. Thank God for that. Sin like leprosy starts out small, but it grows, it progresses. It can take you places you never want to go. It separates. It separates uh, us from God and it leads to death if we don't go to the great physician. You know, it's interesting that you, you don't oftentimes read about leprosy being healed. Leprosy was cleansed. That's what the Bible says. Sin, cleansed. And when you become a child of God, guess what? You can still sin. And you probably will if you live long enough. But you can have a continual cleansing, it says in 1 John 1, 7, if you walk in the light as he is in the light. A continual cleansing. Cleansing from sin. So I ask you this evening, as Ananias asked Saul, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Don't leave here in a lost condition. Do something about it. Tonight, come while together we stand and sing.